Um, okay, yeah, we can begin. Welcome everyone to this uh, session of the Interdisciplinary Summer School, the preschool week. Um, we are delighted to have Andrea Hiot here with us. Um, we uh, wanted to sort of have the opportunity to uh, also discuss some of the other topics that have been covered over this week. And uh, I think Andrea was, uh, wants to uh, share some of her particular research and ideas. So we are uh, delighted to, to have the opportunity to hear directly from you live. And hopefully next week, we'll also have uh, some more input. Um, so yes, please uh, take it away. OK. Hey, everyone. It's really great to be here and to see you. This came together really at the last minute. So I just want everyone to know that we just sort of decided to do it. So thanks for coming for your Friday night. <laughs> Um, and I guess for you all who were here earlier, uh, a couple days ago, we heard a really great talk by Michael Levin, and he had sent us a few papers to read before that. And I don't know about for you, but for me, it was the first time I'd seen these papers. And um, it really, I found it really exciting just based on a lot of things I've been studying and thinking about and doing my own work on. And um, there was also some great discussion in the Discord so we just thought, let's talk a little bit about it. And just as a way of framing it, I was going to talk about it through my research, which I'm more or less, um, I work in all kinds of different uh, disciplines and on many different things. I'm not going to go into all that here. You can look me up if you, if you want to. It doesn't really matter. What's really important here is that um, I'm very interested in trying to understand mind and what cognition is. Um, and that I've sort of developed uh, a way of understanding it based on how we move through the world. And I call it way making. And um, it's more or less a philosophy of cognition as navigation. That's how it's been described before, because I work a lot with the hippocampus. And if any of you know this area of the brain, it's um, essential, of course. I mean, everything in the brain is essential, but this area of the brain is really important for memory, thinking, knowledge acquisition, and also for navigation. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit in a minute, but um, more or less, I use this as a heuristical model, a lot of new research coming out of the field. I'll talk about it in my other talk in more detail, but more or less, um, I'm sort of trying to kind of collapse this dichotomy of mind and body and do it through understanding cognition as the way we move through the world. And of course, there's many, many different ways you can come at that and a lot of other people have. And I'm just trying to put that research from many di different disciplines together into a way we can think of cognition across species and scales, and I'm calling it waymaking. So if you read any of those papers by Michael Levin or you saw his talk, he talked a lot about cognition as navigation, um, not necessarily exactly in the way I just described it, but the word navigation was said a lot and cognition and um, so I just want to look at a few of those papers, and honestly, I hope we can all discuss it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear what you all thought about it, and just, yeah, look at some of the papers, and of course, I can talk about it through my ideas, but I'd really love to hear what you think, too. So, how does that sound? <laughs> does any, Was anyone there at the Michael Levin talk? Um, well, that's a good plan, I just wanted to mention. Um, <laughs> I think maybe... I think you or Stephen would want to say something about being there at the Mac 11 talk. Or, or, I think it's uh, quite popular research anyway. So it, it's... Yeah, uh, it is. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just sort of jump in with the... Oh, yeah, good. Okay, seems like some people were there. Right, right. Yeah, they're um, replying in the chat. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, I think if you if you kick yeah. us off with some, some of your ideas... Uh, okay. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I haven't, to be honest, I haven't read all those papers in complete detail yet either. So this is just kind of a brainstorming session and um, just a talk and I'll, to see how it connects to some of the research I've been doing. But I, if you, I'll go into my research in more detail later. I don't want to spend the whole, we have like half an hour or something talking about my stuff yet. But yeah, let me try absolutely. and share the screen. Is that working? Yep. All right. Okay. Can you just mm -hmm. see the one slide now? Yep. 
Okay, so let's just like have a kind of brainstorming session of what if we imagine cognition as navigation? Um, what would that mean? So I don't know what you all think about cognition. I guess it depends. You probably there's so many different people from different fields here, a lot of really smart people, and I don't know where where that word fits into your research. But feel free to let me know or or say anything. But I'm really thinking about all cognition. So not only like what we mean by mind and thought and thinking and memory, but any sort of cognition. I think even re pre-reflective cognition. We can really see this as like a continuous. Spectrum of different forms of the same process is more or less what I'm saying. So when I say cognition, I don't necessarily mean like something we're aware of, like memory and thought and these these things. I can also mean pre-reflexive cognition, all the stuff that happens that's cognitive that we don't even know is really happening in in terms of thought. So uh, what would that really look like? I mean, that's what I'm trying to imagine in my work, which I'll talk about next week, but. There are a few key ideas of this idea of waymaking, this philosophy of cognition that I'm working on. Uh, by the way, I'm at the University of Heidelberg. I work with Thomas Fuchs and that group, which is like phenomenology and psychiatry, but my background is also in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So the ideas of, of waymaking, uh, just take this in like a, a broad brush stroke, but nestedness is very important in scaling. I also worked with um, Georg Nortov on my uh, neuroscience masters, and he talks a lot about nestedness, if you know his work, uh, spatiotemporal neuroscience. But these are just kind of keywords, nestedness, scaling. I think if you heard Michael Levin, he talked a lot about multi-scaling. Um, also this agent-based assessment. Uh, Michael Levin talked also about, can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but he talks a lot about a viewpoint of a certain viewpoint. Um, I think I have some quotes like there, we'll look at it. And this idea of continuity of being continuous, a lot of us here are interested in complexity science and this idea of trying to get past thinking about beginnings and ends and um, of things only moving in one direction, which is a very hard thing for us to do, but to try to understand this idea of something like cognition as multiscalar, multidimensional, nonlinear, and depending again on this where you assess it, from what agent base, from what position, uh, then it's going to look differently, right? It's going to align differently. And that's not a linear process, even mm -hmm. though it's a continuous process. It's not disconnected. There's not like discrete little, uh, nothing is separate from anything else. It just might not be reachable by one position that you're in. So this, if you really take all of this seriously, it's going to change how we understand space and time and landscape because these become uh, relative to the position in a way, even though they're shared. So it's going to depend kind of where you're assessing those things, um, how it all aligns to you. Uh, so these are just broad brushstrokes. Don't worry if that doesn't make a lot of sense right now. It's just I wanted to mention it from the outset before we look at Michael Levin's work. So one of the papers that he gave us to talk about and read was this one. Um, Competency in navigating arbitrary spaces as an invariant for analyzing cognition in diverse embodiments. So that's a wonderful title. And you already see that there's a lot of words there that I'm kind of obsessed with. Navigation, spacing, space, and this idea of different spaces. Um, we could talk a lot about what invariant means. I don't know if there's mathematicians there, but uh, let's just look at some quotes from the paper. So... This I just I'm just, mostly we're just going to look at the abstract because since most of us haven't really had time to dig into the papers, I don't mm -hmm. even want to try. I won't do it justice. We'll have to do another session where after we've all really read the paper. But these big ideas, you know, the most salient features of life is its capacity to handle novelty and namely to thrive and adapt to new circumstances and changes in both the environment and internal components. So here we have some kind of problem solving and that life is somehow solving problems. And this is, you know, it's thriving, it's adapting. In my opinion, and believe me, I'm happy if you disagree with me because this is to promote discussion. Um, thriving, adapting, problem solving can all be understood as way making from almost any species or scale you want to look at it from. And as you know, or Michael Evan looks at a lot of biological, cellular, um, all, all kinds of different really interesting examples of, of what he's talking about here is navigation. 
Another quote, instructive examples, uh, this paper goes into many examples of these living organisms solving diverse problems um, and proposes that com competent navigation in arbitrary spaces is an invariant for thinking about the scaling of cognition during evolution. So to me, this is a little bit like um, saying the same thing. It's almost saying like thinking is thinking from my point of view, but I in general, I believe it's sort of the similar idea to, to way making this idea of that um, the way a creature or a position or an agent moves through the world is is problem solving. Also, it's how it's going to throw up, thrive and survive or not. And all of this is way making. And I think this is all cognition as well. I don't see a difference. Um, so in a way, sometimes in these papers, he seems to say like matter is scaling up to mind, which is not, uh, that that's still true in my point of view, but matter is already cognitive. There's nothing that's making its way, which I would say is nothing is not alive. Um, we could get into the machine part later, but let's just stay with life now and this general idea of any position or agent that has to make its way on its own resources with the resources that it finds as its position. Um, all that for me seems to be way making, and I think it's all cognitive. I don't know. Do you think he's saying something similar here or not? But we can go on. And then another one, an observer-focused viewpoint that is agnostic about scale and implementation, illustrating how evolution pivoted similar strategies to explore and exploit metabolic, transcriptional, morphological, and finally, 3D motion spaces. So I find this really wonderful and exciting because, in a way, it's kind of what I'm trying to say although he uses different spaces, but um, I'm saying physical space, mental space, virtual space, uh, what we call conceptual space sometimes in neuroscience. Um, all of these are actually not different spaces. They're different ways of measuring a continuous process um, and different kinds of cognition, but it's all cognition. And of course, from what position you look at that stuff, from what viewpoint, you're gonna see it differently. For example, transcriptional and morphological, these aren't, you can't really take those out of each other or away from each other, but you're going to, like, depending on what you're trying to look at and from where you're looking, you're going to see it as transcriptional or morphological. So I just see some key ideas of that paper, uh, multi-scale competencies, he says this a lot. So what do we need these competencies for? I love this word competency, it reminds me a lot of Daniel Dennett's work and um, competent without uh, without comprehension. I can't remember the phrases exactly right now, but there's a lot of really great stuff around thinking of competencies um, and many scales of different kinds, but what is it towards? It's towards thriving, surviving, navigating. To me, this is all ways that a creature makes its way through whatever it encounters. And that can be in virtual space too, by the way. Um, and he talks about it, navigation as a common process across all these different spaces, like the morphological and the transcriptional, and also um, as a step towards how we could maybe start to understand different embodiments. So I really love this idea of thinking of the agent base or the position and how a lot of what we do in science is try to find ways to put ourselves in other positions. You know, even if you think of a microscope or a telescope or some basic scientific instruments, we're trying to kind of see what it's like to assess the world from a different position, a cellular position, or the position of a bat to go to this you know, famous paper, or um, a lot of the examples Michael Levin gets, gets to. And I think he's saying something similar about that. And of course, also, if we think about AI and all of that, uh, it gets even more intricate. Another paper he gave us, Bioelectric Networks, the Cognitive Blue Enabling Evolutionary Scaling from Physiology to Mind. So again, I think we have this, I mean, if we're just looking big brush strokes, there's this feeling of how are we moving from something like a cell to something like this, what we're doing right now, um, talking about ideas, you know, using virtual rooms and so forth. Um, how do we get from bodies, you know, insects and newts and all these examples that he shows us to something like what we have taken for granted as something different, which is like mind and um, memory and something that seems different, but actually could just be continuous uh, process and from our position feels different. <clears throat> Here's another, some quotes from this paper. Uh, I really like this and, and here it confuses me a little bit too. Like each of us made the remarkable journey from mere matter to mind, starting life as just chemistry and physics 
I'm, this is uh, a little bit edited, and slowly, gradually becoming an adult human with complex metacognitive processes, hopes, and dreams. So again, we have this feeling, he really sets this great feeling of this spectrum, this continuous process, this many different scales, uh, that's a journey from matter to mind. Of course, that's only if we're judging it from our human position, right? That it's from matter to mind. Um, we could look at it from the cellular perspective and it would look a little different, but it's going to still be doing something similar to what he says here. Uh, though we feel ourselves to be a unified single self, the reality is that all intelligence is collective intelligence. So here he's kind of saying, saying that each of us consists of a huge number of cells working together to generate a coherent cognitive being with goals, preferences, and memories that belong to the whole and not to its parts. So again, right, uh, we are, we've somehow this mind, that life has evolved that we think of as a self is now looking at these all these different parts like cells and so forth uh and trying to understand what what it's doing but we can also through our science look from the position of a cell and uh, there's a lot of books like very actually well-known scientists now writing about self a, a cell as having a self or a cell as being intelligent in all these kind of traditional ways so yeah, the, you know, it's not like a crazy idea to think of a self as also a cell as also intelligent. Um, if you look at it from the position of the cell as the cell being the agent base, the cell being the position. Hmm. So again, basal cognition, just basic cognition is the quest to understand how mind scales, how hmm. large numbers of competent subunits can work together to become intelligent intelligences that expand the scale of their possible goals. I totally agree with the uh, idea behind this, but I almost think it's like the opposite. Mind is actually the quest to understand how cognition scales, because I think it's more like cognition is all of this process of way making. And what we call mind is this human awareness of that process. It's like how we've out of this process as a part of life, become aware of that process of scaling. Um, so, but otherwise, yeah, I think, we're saying something similar. And again, the key idea is scaling, nestedness, the symmetry between intelligence of developmental morphogenesis and of behavior. So again, you have this very blurry boundary. Where does behavior, such as navigational behavior, begin and end? Um, isn't mind, uh, even like from our perspective, it's hard to understand, but what we're really doing when we remember something or when we uh, engage in acts of metacognition or even read a book or even do what we're doing now together, is kind of look at our own um, patterns of behavior. You know, it's it's process. It's like patterns of of that the body has uh, used to align with whatever it's found in its encounter, be that papers or books or conversations. Um, and we're we're reassessing those in a similar way to what a cell does. Uh, if you really look at it in this way, that I think Michael Levin kind of lays out in a nice way. So yeah, an evolutionary pivot that repurposed the algorithms and cellular machinery that enable navigation of morphospace into the behavioral behavioral navigation of the 3D world, which we so readily recognize as intelligence. I, I, I don't know, again, I would love to hear what you all think that means. And especially if we spent more time really um, digging into the paper, but I I see it again, not, not so much as a pivot as um, a paradigm shift from our perspective or a change um, in scaling up or um, finding new ways to repurpose, as he says, uh, the way other ways that we've made our way in the world as life. If we think of life as some sort of continuous, completely multi-dimensional ongoing process. There's a lot more papers, of course. I think he gave us like six. So I'm not going to go through all of them because I think we were just going to have like 40 minutes or something together here, but uh, <clears throat> I'll just touch briefly on these last two. Darwin's uh, Agential Materials, Evolutionary Implications of Multiscale Competency in Developmental Biology. And then the other one, uh, there's plenty of room right here, Biological Systems as Evolved, Overloaded, Multiscale Machines. Um, great title. And this also gets into another subject which we could talk about forever, like life and machine. And do we need to call life a machine or yeah, we can talk about that some other time, but uh, here's some quotes from there. The implications of morphogenetic problem-solving competencies for the evolutionary process itself. This is what this paper is talking about. 
Um, biological structures have a multi-scale competency architecture where cells, tissues, and organs exhibit regulative plasticity, the ability to adjust to perturbations such as external injury or internal modifications, and still accomplish specific adaptive tasks across metabolic, transcriptional, physiological, and anatomical problem spaces. So again, we're doing big brush strokes here, but I think just some of those words I introduced from the beginning, we're seeing a lot uh, here where we have, we're understanding a continuous process as um, assess, we can assess it through its various scales, its nestedness, but it is continuous. And also we can see how uh, we can we can sort of look at different spaces and see similar patterns, even if it's not at all. I mean, a transcriptional space and then um, morph morphogenic space are different spaces when, in terms of what we're trying to look at them for, but the patterns are similar and connected. Uh, again, he's um, this is interesting too because I feel like he's really dissolving this mind matter. Uh, so-called divide, which everyone who studies philosophy, we, we've kind of got obsessed about this, about the difference between mind and matter, body, mind. Everyone says they're not a dualist anymore, but we still sort of talk in that way, and we're, we seem to be sort of stuck in this mind-body problem, so-called. Um, and he seems to really be getting past this with a lot of his work, um, abandoning these hard boundaries. And again, oh, here's this observer-dependent pragmatic view. For me, that's very close to what I think of as an agent base. Um, and I mean that in kind of complexity science, sort of, of a base or an agent, you know, who's kind of doing edge work, so, so to speak. Or, um, But I, yeah, again, it's this, this idea that there's a viewpoint or there's a position from which you're going to view this ongoing process and it's going to align differently. But of course, many positions are going to have so much of that process in common or overlapping that um, there's going to be these patterns that scale. So we talked a lot, I've talked a lot about the cell, but we could also think about a social body, a political body. Um, those are also uh, bodies in, in this sense that would also have similar scaling dimensions in this way that I think he's talking about or that I'm definitely talking about. Living systems perform multiple functions in the same place at the same time. So again, I think this is really something I think about a lot is how all these spaces are actually the same place, space, and even across species that we're, we're part of that life, trying to understand that life with our tools, uh, and that all these spaces, mental space, physical space, virtual space, genetic, transcriptional space, morphological space, aren't actually different spaces, but it, it helps to, to call them different and to have these dichotomies um, in terms of if we think of them as tools. So it's not that we need to get rid of these words, um, more that we need to see, oh, we're just using this to understand a common process. And I feel like his work is doing that a bit, more, more than a bit. Um, so again, these are just some key ideas which I, I talk, think, think about a lot in my philosophy or my work um, and that I see here and that I would love to talk about or just raise here and we can talk about later. This multispatiality, multiscalar scale, how does all this fit together? For those of you who are modelers or computational modelers or who work with, um, you know, modeling certain kinds of complexity science problems, I think a lot of, we're all sort of trying to visualize this already in different ways. Um, how do we how do we visualize something that's nonlinear that doesn't begin or end that's continuous and connected and that from wherever we sort of so, sort of move the agent base wherever we're going to drop into a position everything is going to align a bit differently even though everything is still continuous and and, and shared this has a lot to do with top topography and different kinds of spaces but. I think we, we're actually finally getting towards a place where we might be able to model that. Um, changes according to position of measurement, but is it the same continuous process? Yes, okay. Um, and this idea of navigating, uh, is it always navigating? Because I don't use the word navigation only because in neuroscience it's a really specific word, and in other disciplines too. For example, like you have a goal, you know, that you have in mind. And this can get very tricky. I mean, you don't, when you're making way or when a creature at some scale is making way, the goal might be to survive, but it's not, sometimes it's not a goal at all. Sometimes we're just wandering, aren't we? 
and that has some implications that aren't necessarily goal oriented and there's also way finding there's all these different ways right so with way making i'm just trying to say okay it's all of it. it's navigation it's way finding it's wandering it's whatever encounter you're in whether you're reading a book or walking through a park or watching something or creating a computer program or coding your your body is an agent within an encounter and that's making way so that's the only reason i don't use navigation but for general purposes i think the way he's using navigation in his papers is exactly uh the way that i mean way making um yeah and just trying to get beyond dichotomy this is a big theme in a lot of our work as philosophers and neuroscientists and um and trying to stress the continu continuity. I'm not going to go into it here because I it's already been a bit of time, but there are other fields, of course, which are saying something similar, I think, to this approach. So what I've studied a lot is neuroscience. Um, I love seahorses <laughs> because in um, Greek, which I'm in Greece right now just by chance, the hippocampus means seahorse. Um, and this is what your hippocampus looks like. You have two of them. Sorry if you all already know this, but you have two hippocampi, one in each uh, side um, hemisphere. And um, this is another example of a lot of the things I've just been talking about. If you really look into all these papers, which I'll talk about more next week, but I won't go into now. But in a really, really general sense, the hippocampus is famous for memory. I don't know if you've ever heard of someone named H.M., Henry Meliason is his real name, but he was only known as HM. In the 1950s, uh, they had removed his hippocampus, and it's more complex because they remove different parts. But in any case, the story is they removed the hippocampus. He couldn't he couldn't make new memories. So from that time on, it was like okay, the hippocampus is all about memory. <clears throat> I'm generalizing, but that's pretty much the story. Then in the 1970s, maybe you've heard of these things called place cells, grid cells, border cells. They were found in the same place. This took, you know, 30, 40 years for all these cells to come together, but now it's often called the GPS of the brain because the hippocampus is also this place where cells fire as you move through your environment, very much like a GPS system, with these kind of weird multi-scale spatial patterns, um, very much connected to the kind of patterns I was just hinting at uh, in the biological work. And so it's, and they also talk about conceptual space knowledge space. Um, and so there's a lot of new papers, more or less kind of saying, okay, actually it's not memory or navigation, because that was kind of almost a bit of an argument for a while. It's, this is somehow the same process. Um, so it's like what I was saying, you know, it depends which space you're looking at, it's going to measure differently, but these patterns and the scaling is actually the same thing. So I, I know that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but um, hopefully just getting the idea of how one part of the brain can be essential for knowledge, memory, thinking, and also for how you navigate and move through the world and wayfind. It's the same. Uh, so I think that's, a. I mean, I'm definitely generalizing, but it's kind of what I'm saying. Okay, waymaking is memory. It's thinking. It's also how you get through the park. It's, you know, finding the kitchen. It's all, it's all of those things. It's all cognition. And if you want to look at the cell, it's the same. Or you want to look at the, any other species. That doesn't mean they're having thoughts necessarily or aware of their thoughts. Um, but it does, it does mean it's cognition. It doesn't, we don't have to argue about are other creatures um, capable of cognition. Of course they are if they're making way. But that's different than saying they have a mind of some kind. Uh, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of papers on this if you want to look. But... It comes out of this Eichenbaum Tolman tradition of the way that we think about uh, the hippocampus, concept space, and all of this. Cognitive maps, maybe you've heard of it. Some of you probably know more. All in all, it's just the question is could we think of cognition as navigation? And as I was saying, I don't think navigation is the right word to use, but the idea is, is right. Uh, I think it's better if we just think of it as something like way making, where we can talk about any kind of movement through any kind of encounter. And we can expand what we mean by space and, and time. And we can talk about all these different landscapes um, and spaces as all of them being <clears throat> cognitive at different species and scales. And um, this is what way making is if you 
want to know more out, we'll tell you more next week. But this is what I'm trying to, to understand here is how we can think of cognition across scale and species as a common process and start to really think of life, what, however you want to define life, um, as yeah, one common process that is cognitive and also getting a little more nuanced about what we mean by mind. Um, that mind is actually maybe what we're using to talk about this particular human sort of cognition, which doesn't make it better or worse than other forms of cognition. It's just a different scale. <clears throat> so I would love to hear any questions or anything, anyone, any pushback or <laughs> just, you know, what you thought about Levin's work and papers or about cognition. And I also have some questions um, that we can talk about now or later. And I didn't even get into the whole idea in some of his papers about the mechanics and computation and, and living systems, um, calling them computers. Of course, he has a different word for what a computer means. It's all very interesting. Um, and it would be interesting to try to think about how this continuous process of way making goes into the technological. But that might be too much for today. So <laughs> I'll just leave it. But uh, yeah, what does anyone have any comments? I can't. I see there's things in the chat, but I can't yes. actually see. Um, yeah. Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Andrea. For that. I think mm -hmm. that's uh, that's mm -hmm. great. I was I was sort of uh, holding off uh, comments and questions just so, so we got the picture of, okay. of of the ideas in the canvas, so to speak. Because there are many things that I think mm -hmm. we can go into. I, I am particularly interested in, interested in uh, the concept of space and generalization of space, uh, because obviously um, the whole foundation of saying that you're way making is some kind of generalized form of understanding cognition obviously way making where right like you need to we need to think about what yeah, the space exactly. is. So, mm -hmm. so we can get into that i think Stephen though had a question because uh, uh, about 10 minutes ago uh, he asked if he could ask some questions so please Stephen, go ahead okay yeah thank you carlos and and thank you andrea i super excited to, to hear your thoughts i i absolutely love the the concept of way making i oh, um, can't wait to see your your mm -hmm. next presentation next week. Uh, just to give you some background, I, I'm going to be talking about an effort that we are starting here to, to do what we are calling the collective computer. But there is something, oh. I want to hear your thoughts, because there's something that really makes me about um, that it's, every, I, I, have, I love everything that he's saying, but mm -hmm. this concept of problem solving really mm -hmm. bothers me. It, it's like, mm -hmm. It, 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 I don't know how to describe it. Uh, I am struggling to articulate it, so I would love your thoughts. Like it, it yeah, seems no, to I've thought about it too. So saying, just talk. <laughs> yeah, that, it sounds like just saying there is a problem and then there is a solution seems like uh, uh, back to dualism, back to like you know mm -hmm. segregating these things in clearly defined. Um, I do think that everything is a problem and a solution at the same time. Every action that an agent can take, or you know, I mean, if we, yeah, I don't know. I, I just want to hear your thoughts on that because I, yeah, yeah, I, th I think this thank is you. like well, no, thank you, and I'm really interested in this collective computing, but we'll have to talk about it more. But um, yeah, I think this is the hardest thing to talk about, and we're in a way trying to find new language for it. I don't know how much anyone here is interested in neuroscience, but there's been a big debate lately uh, with Butsaki, if you know him, he's one of the most famous neuroscientists and thinking about like, um, maybe we're using the wrong words because all of these words are just like things we inherited, like problem solving um, that already have this long feeling that we can't like, we can't get out of and that they're kind of built as dichotomies, they're they're we can't even talk about them without getting stuck in these old ruts. And for example, something like memory, we're looking for it in the brain when maybe it's not like the, looking for something called memory in the brain is completely the wrong way to go about it. You know, if if it's more like a continuous process. So I won't go into all that now, but I think it it reminds me of what you're saying about problem solving, about how something about it feels wrong, because. If you already have called something a problem, then there's already this weird plate of the human cognition coming on board with like a lot of, um, we're making a lot of assumptions already. I think that Levin's trying to get past that, but of course we have to use language, you know, and problem solving is a good way to talk about what he's talking about. You know, we have to use language. I mean, 
it's just that how can we like start to understand, okay, we're just using language and we're using these dichotomies to talk about something that is complex in terms of complexity science, that is always able to be seen from a different position. And so the problem isn't always a problem, actually. I mean, it's, um, if anything, it's, I think about Gibson. I don't know if you like J.G. Gibson, but this idea of uh, this approach where we try to understand um, beyond the dichotomy that actually this process is just ongoing. You never stop it and freeze it and say, oh, there's the problem and there's the solution. Life doesn't do that. I mean, but we're at a point now where we can become aware of our cognition and do that. And that's a tool. But yeah, I think there's something wrong about trying to um, impose that on all scales um, of what I call way making or, or, or just of, of any uh, uh, creature trying to, any creature surviving and thriving, right? They're not even necessarily trying to. So it just gets very hard to talk about. And of course we could talk about, like try to unpack that forever, but I do think the solution is more in just as you're doing, becoming aware of it as it's not quite the right term, but we're trying to find the right term. And um, yeah, like trying to open up that space, right? Like uh, we're using these words as tools, not as uh, something that actually fits directly on to life, you know, in all its forms. But anyway, thanks for the question. There would be a lot more to say, but. Yeah, hopefully we'll get plenty of time. Uh, for that um, here in person yeah. when, when, when we, we have the chance. Um, so maybe mm -hmm. I wanted to, because I, I find this fascinating. I, I really like this idea of, of wave making. It, it speaks to me particularly because I'm a very sort of spatial uh, navigation kind of person. I'm very sort of like personally, I, I enjoy mm -hmm. it a lot. Mm -hmm. So so it, it really speaks to me. But at the same time, um, I have two main issues with, with, with the concept. I mean, I think it, it can be very powerful, but I, I find two things that are confusing me a little bit or that need I would need some kind of clarifying. Um, one is what kind of space uh, are, are we are we talking about? I mean, this is something that I, I, it, it gets super interesting, and it's mm -hmm. something that I've also actually uh, chatted with with Michael a little bit uh, on on this topic of what you know what makes a space a space. I mean, from a more pedantic mathematical mm -hmm. point of view, would you say uh, that a space is any sort of sufficiently infinite, infinitely big set or does the space have to have mm -hmm. some kind of structure like uh, directions or uh, distances or these kinds of things to, to, to call it a space? Right? I mean, mm -hmm. this, and, and, you know, is topology the relevant aspect of the space? Is that the actual thing that we care about? Or, you know, and, and then there is the, mm -hmm. the, the, the component of what are sequences uh, beyond, so, sorry, what are mm. paths, oh, yes. ways <laughs> beyond uh, sequences, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and, this, and this kind of. So, I don't know. I don't, would you do you have thoughts about this? I mean, would you like to sort of like oh, brainstorm yes. a, little, a little too bit? Too many thoughts. Okay. You're raising all the words that yeah. Go for it. Go for so it. I'm I'm completely obsessed with space <laughs> and Good. time. That makes two of us. And I mean, I'm talking like oh yeah, like studying Newton and Einstein and like all those old arguments, Bergson, like what is space and time? I I read about it all the time and hmm. um or I, I've looked at it a lot and what you're saying too about looking at it in terms of um, how we model and do coding and, and sequences and like, oh man, it, I mean, we I could talk about it forever, but I'll just say that I think it kind of even goes back to the other question a bit that I think the answer is in somehow understanding it's not an either or and um, it's not, uh, what, we're, what we're doing is um, <laughs> we're trying to take a look at an ongoing process that never stops and we're using tools to do that and space itself and time those are just kind of assessments from a position so depending on what that position is it's going to align uh differently and i think that's why i use encounter because it's the one word i've found that can actually be used no matter which definition of space you want to look at, no matter if you're trying to create some kind of category set or you're wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you can still think of it as an as an encounter from whatever the agent is, like wherever you're going to put the agent base. Um, and you can start to think, I write a lot about this, by the way, in my master's, because I, I thought about this a lot, about space and time and how to do this. So maybe we can look at that and talk about that later, because that'd be too much now. But 
what I've kind of just found is that the best way to think of it is, is space and time are, are assessments. They're not, um, we're never going to, you can think of it, I think, as like regularities, statistical regularities, um, but it's always a measurement. It's not like, uh, it's always going to be um, whatever the agent is encountering, let's just say, you know, and we're not only one agent as we saw in this. So you can look at your cell the, as an agent. You can look at what you think of as your entire body as an agent. You can look at your family, your social. So it's really going to depend on where you're going to set the parameters. Um, and you're going to find certain statistical regularities. And of course, we can get into all these philosophical arguments then about reductionism or about like um, Um, I think we lost Andrea, maybe. Yep. Uh, give me a sec. Oh no, Andrea's here. Um, can you hear us? I didn't touch anything, did I? Because <laughs> I did change the view for a second, but. Um, can, can you hear me, all of you? No, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we can, we can hear the recording as well, so. Yeah, okay, yes, yeah, she dropped. No, definitely the engine it. Yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> um, interesting. Um, Yep. So I think I would I would uh, comment. <laughs> she moved on, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Let's give it. Let's give it a couple of minutes for uh, her to rejoin. Oh, here she is. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yep. Hello. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Great. <laughs> okay, good. I'm just going to keep the video off and the screen, but yeah. I don't know where I went off, but I was going. Yeah. But you said there was another problem too, and I don't want to not hear that one. Space and time, we could talk about a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, before before moving to the to the other issue, I think, um, I'm 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 curious just just for the productivity of the of the discussion my part at least um, when I I mean so far when I when I heard space uh, because I agree with your with, with your description that th there's going to be some kind of observer based assessment of some kind of informational uh, you know context and, and you know you're gonna be building compatible uh, or, or to a degree compatible descriptions between different agents and so on I mean I completely share that, that perspective mm -hmm. but I think when um, I mean why why use the the word space and this is maybe going back to the to the, to the issue you were discussing in particular in neuroscience but you know uh, why use the term space over set mm -hmm. or collection or i mean does it does it add anything other than the intuitive um sort of notion that you can traverse it and you can navigate through it or do you sort of assign some some kind of properties like for example that there's a notion of distance or there's a notion of uh, proximity, there's a notion of shape, there's a notion of etc. right? That you normally do in space, in geometric space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, I think uh, this is why I have this whole thing about this ecological orientation, which I didn't go into here. But uh, there's a whole, um, what I see is a kind of an alternative way of understanding what we're trying to do as scientists, as philosophers, as um, people creating computer programs. I mean, basically everyone here. And it's a kind of an ecological orientation, which instead of starting with this uh, dichotomy where we have to ask um, where does space begin and end and is there only one space, it's more like, okay, there's this ongoing encounter that we're somehow part of and we're trying to understand it. And space itself, if you look at the 
science of it, the way it's developed, and you know everything that came out of that. I mean, all of these this technology came from trying to understand that in a way that we use now in a lot of our um, in a lot of our jobs. Um, that that it doesn't it matters. Like these questions are very important, but really we're all in some kind of encounter that we're trying to understand and space is a way that we're trying to understand it. It's a measurement, it's an assessment. And I'm not sure that we need to go much further than that for, yes, we need to think about all these big issues, but when it comes to something like what is uh, cognition, which is a very important question, then I don't think we need to understand where like what space begins or ends, uh, we just need to know there's an encounter. It's ecological in the sense of it's just whatever a perspective finds itself within. Um, and we, from our position, are trying to understand that. So we do it via many, many very mathematical um, ways of assessing space and time, which aren't wrong but they're also not some kind of absolute right. It's that too is evolving. What space is, is evolving, if it makes sense at all. Right. I mean, I mean, my, I think my is question that, is, is, my question so is So you're always going to have different parameters. Right. So, so mm -hmm. I think my question is much, much smaller in a way. I think I am just, I am pointing okay. to, to the use of the, of the term space more than, more than, because mm -hmm. I agree with you, all you all you said the ecological perspective. I mean, I'm completely on board with this view, and I'm actually. Does it what, just what, bother you that there's many different spaces, or oh, sorry, there's a delay. Does it bother yeah, so, you there's many different yeah. spaces or something? Yeah. No, it doesn't really bother me. It's just that um, when what I'm interested in is to what degree, because uh, for example, let, let me let me just say for example the navigational uh, aspect of it. I find it I find very. Um, evocative because we, I mean, we have this navigational experience in in three D space that we're, mm -hmm. we are, you know, wayfinding in a more literal sense, um, and and you know that has some particular properties. You you can even call them. I don't even want to call them mathematical properties, but they're some some informational properties that uh, that I think are mm -hmm. very um, clearly uh, found in in all this morphospaces and you know uh, metabolic spaces that michael levin talks about and so on so I, I completely see the point of making a direct uh connection between the concept of space in a more uh, co conceptually classical sense and some some of these mm -hmm. newer uh, settings in which you know sort of the stage for cognition and things like that i, I completely see the the point my my question is more so where is you know, it's kind of going into the details of when you say I have a space of such things. I mean, is that just a mm -hmm. collection of such things? Because it's, I mean, we, we use this language very casually. I mean, a lot of people say the space of possibilities and you just call it space because it sounds more poetic, I guess, than saying a collection or a family or a set or some mm, other more yeah. sort of like more uh, uh, neutral word and more mathematically sort of a pedantic word to use, right? Um, so my, my, my point is uh, because mm -hmm. space comes with a lot of mathematical space or, or more traditionally conceptual space come comes with a with a sort of an assortment of properties and assortment of machinery that that is quite specific to space it's not the same to to have you know the natural numbers as your data structure to model cognition than to have whatever a torus that that is that lives in four dimensions or seven dimension or whatever i mean those things are quite different uh, informational substrates to to do modeling or to try to predict behavior and for things to, to navigate so my point is more about mm -hmm. what is it about space that that we need specifically or is space in this sense some kind of more evocative term that we're just throwing out there so that we get the the intuitive uh, background that we have and and we allude to those to those intuitive experiences of navigation so that you can make mm -hmm. a more general metaphor of i'm going to do the way making and, and that's what really matters here that's so my question is very small in some sense i'm just mm -hmm. sort of asking about the details of do we actually want or care about all those almost mathematically detailed uh specifications of what spaces yes. carry or is yes, it just a care. more general use of the word <laughs> I think we, we do care. And I think right. it's, um, this gets very complicated because with, I think mathematics is 
the most important tool we have. And I mean that in terms of the way it's used in computing too, not necessarily just the maths, but because it's the way that we can, we can um, sort of develop this third uh, space. I don't know, like this, we, we always have dichotomies, right? You have thinking fast and thinking slow. You have all, everything is always in dichotomies. But with our science, what we're trying to do is find ways to kind of um, zoom away from that and see how it's all uh, a matter of perspective, that those spaces look differently according to where the position is. It goes back to this agent base and this alignment. And I think maths is the best way we can do that. And so what the question you're asking isn't very small at all because I, it's like saying... Um, it's just a, a lens. It's an example of the scaling that we have to do. So when you're working in the way that you just described, those parameters that you set and those um, the ways that you're setting them are very important. Um, but when you kind of see how does that relate to the other um, <laughs> ongoing mathematical, oh, gosh, I mean, we're back to problem solving, but with maths, you can sort of see how you're using similar, you're using numbers or you're using similar tools to create these very different niches, if you don't want to call it a space or different programs. I mean, it doesn't have to be called space, but we do need some way of talking about a, a, a statistical, a, 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 a group of statistical regularities as experienced from a position. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. It doesn't have to be space. It's not always space. In, in biology, you do talk about niche. You know, this is why I try to think, think ecologically. Um, yeah. And in, you know, computer science and math, there's all these other words for it. I mean, even a set or something, you know, we, we're always trying to understand how do these statistical regularities hang together from a particular position that's experiencing them. And math yeah. models that, I think, in a really great way. So actually, weirdly, you know, <laughs> the answer to your question is kind of that very process of asking that question. That's kind of the whole sort of point. It's, it's not yeah. that... We, um, it's not that space doesn't matter or that it's a small thing. It's just that what we're trying to figure out is how do all these, how do all these little niches, these spaces, these theories, these um, equations come together into a big hole, you know? I mean, it gets mm -hmm. back to these fairly big questions in, in math, but in just an everyday level, it matters just for being able to have a language to communicate about yeah. where um, parameters overlap and where one kind of uh, niche or space gives way into another and yeah. how do we connect those and change them? Yeah. You can think of it socially, you can think of it yeah. mathematically, you can think of it biologically. I, I, I was going to say, I think um, that I was, as you were saying that, I, I was thinking that one of, the, one of the aspects of space that I think is probably the most useful for, for that kind of description that I've always enjoyed, and as, uh, when I was training as a physicist, that I always regarded as the most beautiful um, aspect of of, the, of modern theoretical physics is this idea of having a geometry that describes the possible observers of a space. So you go mm. sort of one. I mean, this is obviously the, the idea of special relativity and sort of a theory of compatibility of, mm. of frames of reference and so mm. on. But generally, mm -hmm. the concept of frame of reference, I think, is is very powerful in in this sense because, and uh, I do think. And I'm actually working on this uh, as, as part of as part of my of my research in an indirect way, but yeah. but um, I'm working on generalizing the concept of frame of reference in a way. So uh, frame of reference being for everyone who's not completely you know out of their of their first year undergrad uh, linear algebra class is this idea that you have some kind of set, some kind of collection of variables, even coordinates, just uh, and you have a way of saying this set of coordinates corresponds to this thing according to this frame of reference. And if I change the frame of reference, the coordinates themselves will change, but you have some kind of invariance of... of exactly, uh, of, of exactly. Some, That's what right? math is so beautiful to do. And you don't yeah. have to use the word space, but it is what I'm what we're talking about exactly. in a exactly. more generalized way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Someone exactly. in the yeah. chat, I think, is writing about distance too and closeness. Yeah. And I think that is really important. This, yeah. I mean, this, distance is one uh, example of an yeah. invariant that... You know, if you take the distance mm -hmm. in the most classical sense, uh, if you measure the distance between two different points in, points in space and you change your frame, that number is not going to change. The distance yes. number is not going to change. But if you say, you know, the coordinates of those points will change. 
but the distance remains invariant, right? So, so I think I, I, I see I see the point now, and I, 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 exactly. quite, I quite like it because um, I think it is a very powerful uh, way to to point to a notion that we already have very uh, leanly presented in in geometry. I mean, you have this idea of, of a reference frame. Mm -hmm. You know what people call affine geometry. You know, is a very basic way of saying you have actual intrinsic information that exists per se. And, you know, if you want to mathematically describe it, you will have to choose your frame of reference. And then within that frame of reference, you will do your computations. You would get, you know, you would draw conclusions about it. So you would make an assessment, like you said. Um, and then, you know, a different mm -hmm. observer will do a, a different assessment. And the, the important thing is that they can actually communicate and they can make maybe within some re only some, some regime, uh, they can make them their observations compatible and they can compare them. And, and that's the whole foundation for a lot of the modern uh, theory of relativity and, and things like that. So, yeah, I think it's great. Exactly. I mean, and that's where, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, that's where I think math could explain space to biologists or to philosophers in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I'm so interested in it because you, it's already there in a way, these trajectories yeah. and paths. And when you look at complexity science and how you find, um, how you measure distance, but also how you can sort of if you can model it the right way and if you can get past this dichotomy you can you can really start thinking in multi dimensions that are overlapping and how space and distance and what trajectory you're going to take to get to two points can be like you know you can do it in so many different ways and you know with something like um small world theory all these all these theories you you start to see how different trajectories and different lines get away from dichotomy and um you know, two points can be right beside one another and there'd be no trajectory leading to them mathematically. So there's all kinds of wonderful ways I think math could explain this better mm -hmm. than looking at something like this general concept of space that we all have to use um, as if, you know, we're going to be able to define it. But with math, you can start to see, oh, yeah, there's all, like you exactly what you were saying, depending where you're going to set the references and the parameters and so on, you're going to have different spaces, but you can also reshuffle that and see how it's a completely different alignment from another position. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> there's so much there I would yeah, there's, go there's, into. There's but, a lot. Um, yeah. I wanted to, it's rich. It's rich. Yeah, it's very rich. Absolutely. I wanted to give a chance to other people to, to chime in if you mm -hmm. have any thoughts. Because, um, I mean, I could go on forever for, about this because I, I think about this more or less regularly because the, the entire idea of uh, informational navigation and informational spaces is something that you know, it's kind of in the background. Yes. I'm not actively yes. working on this. Oh, but it's, it's so sort of fascinating. Brewing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, any any other comments? Well, questions? we have to talk more because I'm, yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll we'll get plenty of opportunity next week. Yeah, we we can all talk about it more in person. It's Absolutely. already getting kind of late on everyone's Friday night, but yeah. Well, this is a good Friday night plan for me, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, I, this is my kind of Friday night for sure, <laughs> talking about these things. Yes, yes. But um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Any other questions? If not, but, I mean, we can we can um, always keep in touch over Discord and you know keep the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And everyone, just you know, any any anything, write to me because I'm. Right. I mean, I'm I mean, really just, I just, just trying sorry, just to my, understand this more. Peter, uh, please uh, feel free to to jump in. I'm sure that it will be relevant. Don't worry. If you had any thoughts, just so maybe, Carlos, maybe one. Yeah, just, mm -hmm, just please. Um, mm -hmm. Just, I mean, this is just our, because it's Friday night. Like, I don't know. How, how do you how do you react if I say like, what do you think about this idea that Buddhists have about you no know, agency? How's that? How would that be somehow related to this? The idea that there is no such a thing as agency. Um, Somehow I couldn't hear the whole thing. What is, is agency? Or did you say something about free will or something? What if what if there is no such a thing as agency? What is I mean this this oh, this idea yeah. Yeah. touch a lot the the idea of the, the concepts of agents and, mm -hmm. and what, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Like what do you what do you think about mm -hmm. agency and and that maybe maybe the role uh, of approaching this from a perspective of no there is no agency kind of I don't know what what do you think of that? Yeah, I love that question. And it is a kind of a free will question in a way. But uh, I think it's both true that there's no agency and there's always agency. And I know that sounds like a cop out, but there's it's like goes back to this ecological. We can't get out of this encounter that we're in. And 
I think in Michael Evans' paper, he talks about this. I think I even quoted it, right? The self where we just assume we're distinct. But of course, we are also at the mercy of ourselves, right? Which are other little <laughs> agents in their own right. And and it goes in all directions, not just linear up and down, but in all dimensions, we're connected ecologically to other agents. And of course, in reality, there's no agent, but because it's all one ongoing process and no beginning or end, but we can't understand that yet. We don't know even how to visualize that. We're trying to with mathematics, but trying to understand something that is nonlinear, has no beginning and end that we've suddenly found ourselves in is not an easy task. And the way that we've done that is to break it down into um, positions that we can you know, um, understand in similar ways to what we were just talking about with the mathematics. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not wrong to think of an agent as a position that is um, obviously having an effect <laughs> on everything around it from that position. I don't think that's, uh, I, I think trying to think of that as like somehow not true at the same time that that position depends on every other position around it. And so therefore is not really an agent uh, in the sense of like standing alone somewhere. Um, is it's true at the same time, you know, and as, it's like kind of like what what I was saying. We can't. We're sort of freeze framing all this stuff. To talk about an agent is to freeze frame an ongoing process in a way very similar to mathematics, and try to work out how all these things relate to each other and find some formula because it it does something, you know. It's that too is part of the process, and it changes it. So, and that is an agency, but it's not one agent's agency. It's some bigger ecological agency that is hard to talk about without, you know, sounding whatever mystical or something, but it is, it is just, we are in the middle of some encounter we don't understand and how we try to understand it does change it. So that's the kind of agency, I think, at least from, you know, the perspective that we're in here where we're trying to kind of just go through our daily lives and create meaning and, you know, hopefully create trajectories that are positive <laughs> or healthy. So yeah, we're not agents and we're agents at the same time. How do we deal with that is really the big question. That's like this new, hopefully, orientation that we are trying to develop. And that I think mathematics and complexity science and all of this new technology can help us do. But I like the question and I like thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, Thank very, you, very interesting question. Um, any other comments or ideas? What do we mean by dealing with it? I see. Oh, yeah. I, no, yes. I, we mean making way through it, you know? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It's what are we doing right now? We don't know exactly, but we're motivated and <laughs> we're sensory. Um, we're, we're sensing it. We're, we're trying to do something with it. So I guess that's dealing with it. But yeah, interesting term, dealing with it. <laughs> Indeed. I think trying to experience uh, it fully and be part of it. I, I think I, I think this, sorry, I interrupted. Uh, I, I, what I meant by you said that the most important thing is that how we are dealing with it. So it's like, it, to me, it gave the impression that you have an idea what dealing with it, or in other words, you just rephrased. What was I talking about? <laughs> it's funny how you, you say things. About... Don't... You you were I think the question was about being agents and not being agential depending on time for you you were discussing that notion mm -hmm. just a second ago and when you were meant, discussing that you said at the end of the day what's most in, the biggest question is how we're dealing with it and that's mm -hmm. that's what I didn't understand what does that mean yeah uh, thanks for pointing if that it's out. the biggest uh, thing what is that what is the what is the end result and and then you rephrased just now saying it's the making way through it I still don't get it. <laughs> I think what I, what I mean by that is how uh, we become aware of it, sort of what we're trying to do right now when we're looking at uh, what is cognition, I mean, to go to a more practical thing or where how do we define space. By dealing with it, what I mean is talking about it, communicating about it, and in that way becoming more aware of it, and that changes <clears throat> the agency, the possible agency of what we can do about it. And it's always set in some framework, I guess. Like here, I'm trying to understand cognition because I have, you know, bigger goals of uh, it, it's things that just motivate me and that I, I want to know. But I also want to understand how we can sort of 
better understand the connection between all these different species and scales that we separate, you know. So by dealing with it there, I would just say it's becoming more aware of how, like the assumptions that I'm making about those things and how they might be seen differently. And we do that through communicating. So it's more just um, this way of making, how, how a body, an agent, so we're born into the world and we have to, our bodies find their way. We learn how to walk or swim or crawl or whatever it is, you know, depending on what species and what kind of body we have and what we've, what we're capable of. And that's what I'm calling way making. And I think one form of way making that we now have is thought and discussion and what we're doing right now, uh, conversation and how we do that, which for me is a way of how we become aware of our own patterns, um, I think is for me the most important thing that we that we can do right now from this position because it's going to it's action you know it's going to change how we act in the world and how we see our position in the world and how we even understand what a self is and all of that for me is what's important right now and maybe what what a lot of science is sh hopefully showing us a better way to do but that sounds all very grandiose. So it's good you call me out just even on the on the words because I didn't even know I used that word dealing with it. So it's an interesting <laughs> ver verb. Sounds like playing poker. It was a, De yeah, dealing well, the cards. I wasn't so much the word itself. It just felt like you your focus was very clear, but I, I, what wasn't clear was what was in that focus. Like mm -hmm. no, it's good. Does that, does that make sense? I don't know. It does. It um, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, Again, I missed the whole thing. I'm really sorry. I really wanted to catch yeah. it, but I I will I will watch the recording. Hopefully, I will get yeah. all my answers. However, like there is um now just when you were answering me, you were talking about like the whole crawling, swimming, or whatever. So then I'm talk. You are now talking about uh, uh at least anatomically visible space, physical like. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not we we were you were not referring to. Or maybe you were referring to in some sense, but that wasn't about what Carl said the, about the whole mathematical descriptions or rigorous mm, formulation. Yeah, that's of what spaces. I would try to do. Mm, that's what I tried to do in the presentation is show that that's oh, okay. continuous. So then I will catch yeah. that one. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm kind of saying all those are um, scales of a continuous process. So how you know any species or scale, whether it's finding your way through. Uh, whatever through a park or whether it's an ant finding its way through whatever an ant finds its way through um, whatever whatever the species or scale you set it at which for me includes if you're reading a book or you're doing a category set or you know you're coding or whatever we're doing all of those are in w forms of way making what changes is the statistical regularities of the encounter and when you say encounter, are you speaking of our subjective experiences? No, I'm speaking of whatever is having to be sensed and made sense of uh, by the agent towards whatever so, they're doing. So, so like in, not, in the case mm -hmm. of, you know, if you give me a particular, like I, I, uh, in the case of um, someone who's doing coding, then of course the encounter is, it's the what this the entire sensory space they're in not only the computer and the and mm. the and the python or whatever they're doing but also of course like everything up to that point you don't get out of your own trajectory mm -hmm. um, but the statistical regularities overall are going to be f more based on like if we're going to look at that um we had this whole discussion about what space is so it's hard to use the word now but if we're yeah. talking about coding <laughs> space yeah yeah, <laughs> you know, coding space, then we're going to have certain parameters that we set there. So, uh, Pinar, I have a question just uh, coming yeah. here. Would you would you describe uh, yourself as navigating some sort of space when you're doing development of like sound or you're sort of in this sort of sound world uh, in, um, in your work? Mm -hmm. In, in terms of creative, I mean, we're now like using words interchangeably a lot. So it's like hard to say that we are referring to the same thing when we're saying the same words. Uh, right. But um, let me let me let me I, rephrase. I, let me let me rephrase. Yeah. Maybe let, I'll just rephrase for a little bit. So yeah. um, would you because I when when I just reference when I am, for example, improvising some music, I 
do yeah. have a sort of mental picture. I, I said in the beginning, I'm a very visually minded and very navigationally yeah. minded person. So I do have a some certain sense of musical landscape that I that I'm navigating and sort of like yeah. maybe they don't have strong sort of uh, geometric shapes or anything like that. But I do have a sense yeah. of I were I were I was there and then I went there and then I went there yeah. and, and I could draw it if I wanted to, right? I yeah. could make a, a sketch about it. So do you do yeah. you have a similar experience with sound more generally, where it's like more sound design, not just music, which is more sequential because it's like we are playing in time. Yeah, um, I would say um, maybe not one to one like yours, but definitely I was going to use the possibility space, which which means right. that I could go anywhere, but some are more likely. Right. Um, depending on what comes in, obviously it's constantly updating uh, in a way, uh, especially yeah. if you're improvising, that's how you should be because you're like react, you're in, you're literally in a, in a conversation yep. using mm. just uh, a translated uh, language, which is not words, which is not vocal, well, maybe vocal, <laughs> but like, um, yeah, through some sort of device, the instrument that you're using, all the muscle memory and everything, like every single thing that sort of, um, in a way, filters. By filter, I mean I'm thinking of it like a filter, like a mute, like an audio filter, like yeah. an EQ. Like if you have bins of spectrum, you know, frequencies, yeah, yeah. and each frequency is like a, a, a musical path you could potentially follow, or a next point in that journey. Uh, every single oh, input sort of alters the filter of the EQ. That's my analogy yeah. in my head. Yeah, I mean, you can say that it's like a constant updating of situation. And uh, if you take little snapshots, it might look discrete points, but surely it's not. Um, that being said, um, it's not always like super clear from the beginning. Uh, you don't have exactly have the map. I, I yeah. think that is the that is the interesting part. You you just have a n notion of a sort of a, a direction. Uh, and you can also maybe for the visual people in our uh, among us maybe it's like you can I think you can imagine it like every person has a certain um, a light that shines into the fog ahead, but then mm -hmm. it reveals itself. For some people, maybe with more practice, they are they are able to, to guess. Oh, I can go there, or I can that 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 the, that that fog is less maybe less thick. And uh, if you are just new, that fog will be probably so thick that you wouldn't know what the next move will be even. Mm. Um, I think that could be my metaphor. But when I'm working, uh, I mean, for sound design, it's a bit harder to say because there usually is, um, at least in, in, the, in the case of my everyday work, it would be quite often matches to a visual. So there is already a, a different model uh, of space I need to work with. <laughs> it's a code so to use the word say... space. Would you say mm. that depending on like if you if you thought of that as a landscape, all, all mm. the paths you've you've already gone, like everything you've um, tread up to that point, the paths that you've made are so those you're more likely to follow those paths. It kind of gets back to what you're saying about dealing with it. And I said it's awareness. And you talked when you talked about improvisation. It's a really beautiful way to think about it. Like, would those would you normally follow those paths? But if you're more aware of those paths. Or, or or sort of deciding not to follow them, something new might come. Or I mean, is there? Do you see any connection there? Um, like so habits add, even. Yeah. Well, I I do. Although to just to wrap up the first part of the question. So and then I will answer to that one. If I forget, please uh, pull me back to that. Um, mm -hmm. The first one was the Carl's, um question about the improvisation or the sound design, how that relates to me. I would say my spaces in that case, in the sound design case, is not as a as not one to one. It would never be one to one, anyways. But it's not really directly translatable as music because music has a different uh, meaning set <laughs> as they, or at least mm -hmm. the Western music. I mean, any kind of music actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Surely, um, um, yeah, there, there there are things that are translatable. But when when you're with me. But when I'm talking about when we say music, and if most people envision a classical, more traditional sense of heart, like harmony, bass, whatever, like a, a music piece that is following the p possible rule sets of Western theoretical structures, um, um, uh, which I mean, even if you're improvising within those things, I think the things you're gonna go is probably more likely the things that you're going to do because you're, you're using muscle memory and muscle sometimes just follows itself and you sometimes do it before you're even aware of it sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the things that you practice more, like if you can, I'm, I'm, I can't, I, I didn't study this, so I, can't, I would love to read some studies if anyone did study it. But like, probably, if you're doing again, if you're working with something physical like an instrument like you're playing guitar or drums or piano or whatever uh, if you're a musician you you spend a good chunk amount of your time your your body being trained on navigating those uh th- those notational uh, sequential whatever like the the the, 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 the well let's go spaces those sets but you're using mm-hmm. your physical you know thing your fingering position etc and then they get encoded they are not so like uh, actively it doesn't, I mean, I know maybe it is if someone studied it, but like, I, I'm not sure if they are so cognitive, they almost feel like reflexive at some point. So then the question could be like, yeah, maybe it does just like one single movement just kind of creates this momentum towards your fingers moving to a certain direction and hearing one note just pushes you towards a certain way. Where does it happen that when you're actively co- like, con- like very, very awarely, so to say, mindfully, very uh, critically even, like more, more, or text-based decisions, decision-making, right? Where does that happen during an improvisation? I think we should ask uh, frequent improvisers on that because I'm pretty sure there are moments where they're like, okay, this is where I want to go. You, you can plan, you can strategize, as we said, you can already have a, the, have a uh, maybe landmarks of the map that you want to, uh, of the territory on your, on your mental map that you want to traverse towards, but exactly what spe- spe- uh, steps, what pathway is going to reveal itself. Um, it might, might, yeah, it might, it, it might be more automatic than we think, or it might be to some extent actually really controllable. I, I'm not sure. Like, I, I can't answer this as a sign, as a scientist, would be, but uh, as an experience, for, like as my experience with the sound design, it, because it's at least in 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 my work, it's so much about the screen, and you know, like you're dealing with uh, a lot of time editing tools. They are designed a certain way. They force you navigate those translations from one mental space to a, a digital like a, actual assets by asset i mean like audio files until you get to that creation export moment mm-hmm. it, there's which is the mature quote-unquote materialization point of an idea that the, the, the translations that you have to do is very much dictated by the medium you're using the software you're using um, um and um, there is not so much like the muscle memory comes more about like shortcuts. Maybe it's going to sound a bit weird, but like you can, I mean, if you extend it, I, don't, I think you can argue some software, if you use it for a long enough time, they become your instrument, right? So you end up mm. opening certain tools that you use a lot. You Your fingers go to a certain short, shortcut when you want to do something like you want to um, reverse a sa- sound or like stretch it. You just do it because you think, oh, this is what I want to do. I'm not sure in that moment if I'm like f- fundamentally aware that I decided and did it, or I did it and then I realize what I did. I don't know what the sequence of events are, the order of time in that sense. Um, for sound, it's very conceptual for me. It starts very conceptual. Some people start directly without even maybe thinking. I, I mean, they they just go to. A, room full of uh, objects they record stuff and they listen and they get inspired like that i can do that too but quite often i do have a feeling or like a um a a very abstract target in my head like okay this is these are the rhythmic uh, motives i want to have in the sound these are the textural things in my head like i cannot i cannot put the thing that is purely living in my head at that moment until I go through the whole process. Mm-hmm. And even then, sometimes it doesn't get super close, but that is the, that is, that is the, like, the closest thing I can say, yes, I do have a map where I want to go. Sometimes I can get, I can follow this map and it turns out that the territory matches it, but sometimes it's, it turns out like I'm using <laughs> a map of Amsterdam in uh, New York or, well, that would might, they might fit, but like, or in, Tanzania or something, you know, like it's, it's, it, it could, it, it's, it, I'm talking really, really metaphorically right now. So it's hard to say, but in practice, uh, the, the, in the practical sense, uh, it, it is, it is, it, um, I think there is, how to say it, like create, creative, create creativity, I think follows similar things, no matter what the medium is, but when you go into the specifics, I think then you're becoming maybe what could potentially translate to your, that's where you're taking a frame, like the, the, 
the points, you're freezing it and everything just becomes very specific to that task. Um, but if you just zoom out a bit, like then, then, then the, those details, I think, translate to many other uh, disciplines. Um, and and you were saying, I think I already answered it a bit, but whether uh, you were you would be likely to do certain things if you've if you've done yeah, it if you look back. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's this thing there, like in my work, at least in the from like my personal work is different than my like day to day. Uh, profession let's say let's put it that way um and in the professional side because we're work i'm working much more with many people and it's project bound there are these phases where we sometimes do retrospectives like look into the like post-mortem we call them in those mm -hmm. times you get to reflect more because in the moment you're just doing 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 and when you get out of that and then you reflect then those paths become clear and then yes there is a moment where you make a decision saying like yeah this path in the future, let's let's not take that that often because that led us a little mm -hmm. in in places that we didn't we spend too much time. Maybe it was too you know whatever. You you come up mm -hmm. with your reasonings, and it it can be as specific yeah. as let's not use this tool again, uh, like this specific software bit. We let's not do that, or let's not like it could be even more specific. Let's say we will never use I don't know metal recordings or something like that. Um, um, or it could be, yeah, even more, uh, it could be more metaphorical. Sorry, I took too much time answering. I don't even know if I even answered anything. No, no, th <laughs> thanks for that. I mean, there's, um, I was asking for it. So, so thanks for the, <laughs> so thanks for the answer. Um, I think Fodi just uh, has the virtual hand raised. So please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've missed a lot of the initial introduction. Um, <laughs> I got here an hour late, uh, but I I want to catch up on the conversation that was already happening, sure. um, and also as somebody who has uh, experience in music, in both in playing and in uh, music production, uh, and dealing with software and uh, sound design also, uh, one a little uh, nice piece of trivia uh, is that in Greek. Uh, in Greek folk music, scales are called roads. So that's a, an oh, interesting wow, analogy. Yeah. <laughs> I love um, that. <laughs> and I, I guess it's not the only language where there's an, an analogy with that. I, I guess it's, uh, it might be similar to other kinds, uh, to other languages. Uh, that would be a nice uh, research question, wouldn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Actually, during listening to both of you talk, I was thinking about how different forms or I don't know, genres of music seem to have different signatures in terms of roads and trajectories and like maps as as you were talking about earlier. There's, it's kind of interesting if you thought about modeling them somehow, like these different mm. landscapes of music. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think that's, uh, I don't know what the conversation was before, but, but from me and um, inspired by Levin's uh, presentation and the papers, uh, it opened up a whole space for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Where did you go into that you cannot escape? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, that's uh, basically there's a multiplicity uh, of modalities of approaching space rather than like just 3D locomotion, uh, which I find very interesting. Um, and also in, in, in music, I guess an interesting thing to um, maybe take into account is like the different ways of doing music, such as like playing an instrument live, uh, composing or doing sound design and then like this hybrid mode of just like a playback type uh, uh, music is like what kind of uh, navigation is that um, at these different modes? Because I find like from practice, I find them very different. For example, composition tends to be that. Uh, and also uh, sound, sound design in a way, any kind of process that is not very, that is not very time, um, uh, time cons time. Uh, how do you call this? It's not like real time, mm -hmm. uh, and it's mostly based on uh, an artifact creating a, um, 
a final artifact which can be replicable, uh, replicable such as in composing and designing. Uh, this process is like there's a lot of planning involved. You, we can talk about maps, like having some maps in the beginning. We can talk about like an initial idea uh, that gets better realized or refined. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is cases of, uh, um, let's say, free jazz or just dummy or uh, playback type um, uh, music with electronics. Uh, and what kind of what kind of navigation is that there? Because it seems that it is way way more explorative. And way and there's way tighter feedback. It is based on a very direct um, and a quick response uh, to a source uh, of their equally direct feedback. So there's a very very tight uh, coupled uh, feedback loop. You're the if the system is you and the uh, whatever is the art the tool the instrument or the software the feedback is very very tight. So uh, maybe another interesting piece of trivia to share, like there's this nice word that I found lately, it's called coldy wombling, uh, which is basically to, to walk um, or to, uh, to go like uh, in a certain direction with uh, a lot of force, you know, with a lot of vitality, but without knowing your exact destination. So <laughs> I say like this, Kinds of Can you more... write that word in the chat? I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cody Wobbly? Yeah. That's really interesting. So I found, I find. But I like more... what you're saying about the. Yeah. Sorry? No, go ahead. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, I find the more explorative forms of uh, this tight feedback, this very direct forms of. Uh, exploration of a sonic or a tactile or kinesthetic space to music uh, as called called it, called it bombing in a way <laughs> mm, very explorative navigation without and you i guess you weren't here but that actually opens up this whole spatial temporal <laughs> thing too again of yeah. By the way, uh, so in sorry to interrupt. I just mm, one thing that came to my mind when I'm listening. I was listening to Fotis is that the improvisation and the like the the, the well, he was differ differentiating the liveness, the uh, real time tightness of uh, improvised music versus something designed or composed uh, as an art and end result artifact. So it just made me think of like you you guys might be already aware of this, but I think if you're not, you should you definitely look into the um, uh, uh, live coding movement. Or I think it's now um, uh, yeah algorithmic uh, like algorithm algorithm etc. Oh, that's an yeah. extension of it, but it started with live coding. So that that is where the whole coding something that is just so like code compile wait whatever all that cycle becoming uh, more like a it's all they 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 really try to bridge that gap of wait that in, that then it, that became something literally you do it on the fly and the music changes as you code and i think andrea might find it interesting because it relates to code and computation uh, oh yeah and, and if you have if you're not aware of that movement it, it's something to look into no, I'm not. I, live coding yeah. it sounds sort live of familiar. What was the music. second word? Yeah, algorithm. Okay, no, I've like never heard great. It. That's great. Um, <gasps> it, 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 the last decade, it got more and more popular. I, wow. I mean, there has been a bit of a, a hiatus since COVID, but I'm, I, I'm, I hope people will pick it up again. Oh, that's so <laughs> interesting. There's just so much there. It makes my, I mean, there's so many fascinating things in there because it mm. also makes me think about how music is not just sound you know <laughs> i mean or, or sound can't be separated from all these other sensory ways of being in the world and moving your body and yeah and also just everything you've heard or created before in this in a sound space how that you bring that into this whatever space you're coding or um creating in i don't know there's so many things that both of you make me want to explore thinking about music in terms of yeah how we make a way <laughs> right so um 
let me just uh, enter for a second. Um, I think it's a good point to maybe close this session. I don't. What I don't want to do is to uh, stop the conversation because we we have to go on do some local organizational stuff. Uh, but I want to I want to keep this meeting open in case uh, you guys want to continue uh, the conversation. What I will do is I will just close the the live stream, uh, but you can remain in the room and you can continue the conversation. Is that is that okay? Yeah, that's good. I, I probably have to go soon too, so. But I do want to continue the conversation somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, we can always continue on Discord. I mean, that's that's uh, it's, it's a reminder uh, for everyone as well that who is either here or will watch the recording, um, and we'll send an email again. Uh, we are going to be on Discord uh, exponentially more as we get closer to uh, the live week. Um, so, so yeah, just a reminder for everyone to check it out and, and you know, to, uh, to keep an eye on, on notifications and so on, because that's how we communicate. Uh, but I really, I really appreciated this session, Andrea. It was just a great prompt. And uh, I think the, the ideas are flowing. I think there's a lot of potential for next week to be uh, super uh, uh, effervescent intellectually already. So I think that this was a great taster and I hope everyone uh, is as excited as I feel for, for these kinds of conversations, especially when we don't have any sort of time constraints and we can just literally go into the sunset at the beach and just uh, continue discussing for hours. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone um, who contributed and yep, uh, I'll see you everyone soon. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Right, stay around.